Hi everybody, Hanu the Honda Mackinen here and welcome to yet another Hanu and the Kaiser podcast. I'm Hanu the Honda Mackinen and joining me again is of course Retro Kaiser. That is I, James T. Kaiser, captain of the SS Kaiser Cade. And yep. Sunday Night Kaiser, and Tuesday Night Kaiser, and all the streams I do now. Yes. yes. And so, welcome to the fourth episode of uh, the Hanu and Kaiser podcast, or Honda and the Kaiser's podcast. Still don't remember the title. We've done three of these, and I still don't remember the exact title. Um, so, in case this is your first time listening, uh, what do we do on the podcast? Of course, is that, well, what we normally do on the podcast, and what we've done on the previous three episodes is... Uh, we have pre- what, the way we normally do this is that I read an Edgar Allan Poe story, and Kaiser uh, reacts slash makes sound effects. Um, except today for the fourth episode, we decided let's switch things ar- around a bit. And today, your reader is going to be Kaiser, and I'm going to be the one making the <laughs> comments and sound effects. So this is going to be interesting. (laughs) And to the listeners out there, if you think that I'm a good reader, just watch the part of um, the Gabriel Knight Free Let's Play we did when we read the digital comic. Well, I don't think you should give your... I I don't think you should drag yourself down because of that, because uh, you did read an entire visual novel, didn't you? Oh, don't remind me. (laughs) So, yeah, you you actually... You have actually a lot of reading experience and again because and, and of course of course my scripts for my reviews oh yeah and also the thing about the gabriel knight one like i don't think that's a fair assessment because we the way we did that was back in the day was that i actually screen shared the pdf through skype which luckily we're not doing this time this time i actually was smart <laughs> enough to send kaiser the uh pdf so he's going to be reading be, he's going to be able to read it properly on his own end yep Yes. No more volcano murders. No more volcano murders. <laughs> or the brutal bard. <laughs> God damn it, I love that. I love that comic reading of ours. It's it's, it's really... Uh, I do too. Yeah. Uh, so I was actually joking about me being um, upset with my skills. What I was trying to translate to is, watch that, watch that episode. That's a great let's play. It's probably my favorite let's play that I've done with you. Yeah, it is one of it's one of my favorites too. I've actually like uh, made a few compilations of that this year as well mm. because I because it's one of those uh, one of those series that I like to just kind of have playing in the background sometimes when I do stuff and everything because it, there's there's some really great shit in there so stuff that I even I forget about. But um, <laughs> all right, so today uh, so the so in the previous episodes we've covered a fairly broad range of different Edgar Allan Poe stories. We started off with a fairly classic one, The Telltale Heart. In the second episode we did. Uh, Benarese and uh, and uh, did I say the name right? But this time, by the way, <laughs> I have no idea. I keep uh, on thinking it's Beatrice. No, I, I, said, I, it I said it wrong. I said it wrong. Berenice, sorry. And we also did Berenice. The, yes, Berenice. Berenice. And, and then then Ber- um, we also did the uh, the 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 the, uh, the portrait one. God damn it. <laughs> Oval portrait. Yep, that's the, that's the one. Oh, yes. oh, that one had a creepy ending. Oh. Yes, and the last episode was a very, very long one where we actually did read the entire uh, story of the murders in the Rue Morgue, um, which which was a long time coming. A really, really classic Edgar Allan Poe story. Today's story that we going that we are going to do, and which Kaiser personally picked for this one, is the Oblong Box, and this one is also one of my favorite Poe stories. Um, I don't have anything, any cool uh, uh, details or things about this story. It, it's it's fairly well known. The only cool tidbit that I can really tell, say about this one, is that this is one of the this is one of the post stories I read in high school, and that's mm-hmm. about it. <laughs> Sorry, no. I'm not no. gonna lie. When when you ask me to pick a um post story for this episode, I'm not gonna lie. I, the reason why I picked the oblong box is because the word oblong it reminded me of an old cartoon I watched years ago called The Oblongs. Okay, I don't think I've ever heard of that. It's pretty obscure now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, but because I don't have any cool tidbits about the oblong box, and I don't think there's anything uh, like super, uh, super. I don't think there's anything about it that really relates to Edgar Allan Poe's life so much. Um, I wanted to just quickly say about another idea that we've kind of tossed around before. I don't know. It's been a while since we've recorded anything together, so I don't know if you remember this, but you've actually suggested that maybe at some point we should do an H.P. Lovecraft cast at some point. Oh, no, I remember that. 
Yes, and because I and we could we could do that because I do have the entire written works of Lovecraft. I have the collection. Nice. Of it. Yeah. I've also got I've also got one H. P. Lovecraft. Um, what are they? Poems, novels? What are they called? Short stories. Well, yeah, he wrote, yeah mostly short stories. But his the one, his it, one no, yeah. novel is also. I have the full collection, so it has the also has the novel in it. Nice, I, I, I but funny. What, I forget what it's called, but yeah, we we could do that at some point. I gotta be honest. I gotta level with you though. After I got that Edgar, I mean, that Lovecraft collection, I started reading some of them. I of course I spooled through them, and I've read some of like the ones that you probably heard of, like you know the Reanimator, Dexter Ward, and. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Color Out of Space, I really like those ones. But the vast majority of Lovecraft's work, I gotta be honest, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> his, his style is just not really my cup of tea. But if you want us to do a Lovecraft cast at some point, we could do that. His stories are a bit longer, though, uh, for the most part. Mm -hmm. So we might have to like spread them out, probably, over a, maybe maybe like a couple of poke, not podcasts, but podcasts. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure I said this on a previous episode, but the the only story, physical story that I have of him is actually <laughs> inside of a Blu-ray cover. <laughs> Ooh, like right. the movie Day, like the movie Dagon that uh, I have, which is part of like some sort of special collection. Um, if you open up the case, it actually has the story of it printed inside the case, which I think is pretty cool. Which you can use as like a reversible cover. Interesting. <laughs> I, I remember. Wait, I might be mixing up, mixing that up, but I, I, but I'm pretty sure which story that is. Is that isn't that the one where the guy finds, uh, in the middle of the ocean, he finds this like ancient ruin? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I am thinking of the right one because there, there's quite a few of those. All right, but maybe we'll do that Lovecraft one. Maybe people in the comments. Uh, leave us a comment if you if you want us to re also read maybe a Lovecraft story uh, on a separate podcast. Uh, maybe maybe we'll do a Lovecraft cast. That, that, it doesn't the podcast is such it's so perfect. It's a perfect to yep. you know to, uh, yeah. a title. It's title. So poetic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. But enough introductions. Now let's turn the honors to Retro Kaiser and turn our attention to the oblong box. Hang on, I'm just turning on my heater. It's bloody cold over here today. All right. Ah, yeah, it... nice warm feet. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, we ready? I'm ready. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Oblong Box by Edgar Allan Poe from the year of 1850. So let's get ready, folks. All right. Sit down, relax, put on a good set of headphones, boil up a nice cup of um, coffee or um, hot chocolate, because this is going to be a sexy one, baby. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to read this seriously. Yeah, 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 go ahead. <laughs> it's, my job, it's my job to be serious for once. Hanu is the one that's designed to be the guy that makes the um, noises. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Some years ago, I engaged passage... Sorry, my glasses are a bit dirty now. Ugh. Okay, redo, redo. Some years ago... I engaged passage from Charleston, SC, to the city of New York in I the fine in packet ship. In, <laughs> in the fine packet ship Independence, Captain Hardy, we were to sail on the 15th of the month, which is June, weather permitting, and on the 14th, I went on board to arrange some matters in my state room. Dee 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 Sorry. dee dee dee. <laughs> Sorry. That was dumb. <laughs> I gotta give you. Some, I gotta give you some extra respect for reading this. You gotta scroll down, which can be a bit annoying if the mouse slips off. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. I found that we were. I'm starting to sound like Chanel. Apologize. I found that we were to have great many passengers, including a more than unusual number of ladies. <laughs> On the list were several of my acquaintances, and among other names. I was rejoiced to see that of Mr. Cornelius Wyatt, a young artist for whom I entertained feelings of warm friendship. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, you don't have <laughs> to apologize. It... I'm the ass. <laughs> oh, sorry. The way, the way you, you did that sound just makes the next sentence worse now. <laughs> He had the ordinary temperament of genius and was a compound of no, no, no. misanthropy. You, 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 skipped, you skipped the line. 
Oh, sorry. Pardon me. He had been with me, a fellow of the universe. So, um, he had been with me, a fellow student at Sea University, where we were very much together. I, I'm not sure if that's C minus yeah. university. Nah, it probably is like in, in Murders in the Room, or he didn't want to say the name of the university, so it's like mm -hmm. C dash. Yeah. All right, go ahead. <laughs> He had the ordinary temperament of genius and was a compound of misanthropy, sensibility, and enthusiasm. Woo to these qualities, he united. <laughs> yes, it's like Animal House. To these qualities, he united the warmest and truest heart which ever beat in a human bosom. Uh, sorry. Ah, oh, stupid scrolling. Okay, I'm just going to stick it here. No, don't, don't make a joke out of that. Do not. <laughs> That's too... <laughs> I observed that his name was carted upon three staterooms, and upon again referring to the list of passengers, I found that he had engaged passage for himself, wife, and two sisters, his own, the state... I read that wrong. And two sisters, his own. The staterooms were significant. Were significantly roomy, and each had two berths, one above the one above the other. These berths, to be sure, were so exceedingly narrow as to be insu insufficient for more than one person. Oh, still, boy. I could still <laughs> I could not comprehend why there were three staterooms for these four persons. I was just at the end that approach in one of these mood, one of those moody frames of mind, which make a man abnormally inconsistent about trifles, delicious trifles. And I confess, <laughs> with shirt that's truffles. <laughs> <laughs> and and I confess with shame that I buried myself in a variety of ill-bred and preposterous conjectures about this matter of the supernumerary stateroom. Supernumerary <laughs> stateroom. Super numerary. Yeah, that, I don't know okay. what that means. I don't, I'm not sure. Super numerary. I think two, the, the excessively many, that's what that basically means. Yeah. Big, pretty much, or something like that. No, no, because he's, he's wondering why he had so many rooms reserved. So that's super okay. numerary. Yeah. It was no business of mine, to be sure. But with none the less particularly did I occupy myself in attempts to resolve the enigma. At, le uh, at last I reached a conclusion which wrought in me great wonder why I had not arrived at it before. It is a servant, of course. Of I course! Said. <laughs> what a fool I am! Not sooner to have thought of the so obvious a solution. And then I again repaired to the list. But here I saw distinctly that no servant was to come with the party. Although, in fact, it had been the original design to bring one. For the words and servant had been first written and then overscored. Oh, extra baggage to be sure. I know. I now said to myself, something he wishes now to put in the hold, something to be kept under his own eye. Ah, I have it, a painting or so, and this is what he had been bargaining about with Niccolo, the Italian slur. <laughs> this idea satisfied me, and I dismissed my curiosity for the nonce. No nuance. No, uh, Nicolino, I think you will find his name. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Nicolino, the Italian racial slur. This idea satisfied... I'm, I'm not saying that word. Um, <laughs> this, the, the, uh, this idea satisfied me, and I dismissed well, what, what, my curiosity. What, what, what would you say, accounts. the Italian Hebrew? Ah, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. The Italian man of Jewish faith. Yes. Wyatt's two sisters I knew very well, and most admirable and clever girls they were. Yeah. His wife he had <laughs> newly married, and I had never yet seen her. He had often talked about her in my presence. However, and in his unusual style of enthusiasm, he described her... <laughs> He described her of surpassing beauty, wit, and an incredible bus size. <laughs> and accomplishment! <laughs> I, I added that one in, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was, therefore, quite anxious to make her acquaintance. I, very, I, very I anxious. I can interject here. Uh, yeah, we're, I, we're making all these silly sound effects and things like that. I, I assure you, the story will get quite dark and morbid in a, in a minute, so just, just brace <laughs> yourself. <laughs> mm-hmm. On the day in which I visited the ship, the 14th, 
Wyatt and party were also to visit it. So the captain informed me, and I waited on board an hour longer than I had designed, in hope of being presented to the bride. But then an apology came. Mrs. W was a little in Mrs. W was a little indisposed and would I don't even know if I'm being a man or a woman. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do normal voice now because I'm trying to do yeah. a speaking voice. Mrs. W was a little indisposed and would decline coming on board until tomorrow at the hour of sailing. The morrow having arrived, I didn't know they were waiting for a bird. I was going from my hotel to the wharf when Captain Hardy met me and said that, owning to circumstances, a stupid but convenient phase. He right. rather thought the independent. Right. Did I say phase? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he rather thought the independence would not sail for a day or two, and that when all was ready, he would send up and let me know. This I thought strange, for there was a stiff, southerly breeze. Oh dear. But as the circumstances were not forthcoming, or forthcoming, although I pumped for them with much pers- perseverance, I had nothing to do but to return home and digest my impatient at leisure. Impatience at leisure. I, I digest. I don't know what noises I was making there. <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit too distracted by this great southerly wind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Continuing on, I did not receive the expected message from the captain for nearly a week. It came at length, however, and I immediately went on board. The ship was crowded with passengers, and everything was in the bustle attendant upon making sail. Wyatt's party arrived in about ten minutes after myself. Hello. There hello, were the two. Hello. <laughs> Good day. There, there were the two sisters, the bride and the artist. The latter in one of his custody fits of moody misanthropy. I was too well used. To, I was too well used to these. However, to pay them any special attention, he did not even introduce me to his wife, the bastard. This courtesy de- devolving, yeah, this courtesy, this courtesy devolving per force upon his sister Marianne, a very sweet and intelligent girl, who, in a few hundred words, made us acquainted. <laughs> few hurried words. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really funny few hundred. <laughs> that bitch would not shut up. <laughs> Sorry, I know that was mean, but <laughs> you really, you really did change the meaning there, quite literally. You might have had something interesting to say. Um, anyway, Mrs. Wyatt had been closely veiled, and when she raised her veil, oh boy, in acknowledging my <laughs> bow, I... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> in acknowledging her, my bow... Oh, I said in acknowledging her vow, I mean, in acknowledging my bow, I confess that I was very profoundly astonished. I should have been much more so. I should have been much more so. However, had not long experience advised me to trust, with to inflict a reliance. The enthusiastic description of my friend, the artist, when in, when indulging comments upon the loveliness of a woman, of loveliness of a woman, of the upon the loveliness of women, when beauty was the theme, I well knew what facility he sought into the regions of the purely ideal. The truth is. I could not help regarding Mrs. Wyatt, Mrs. Wyatt as a decidedly plain-looking woman. If not positively ugly, she was not. <laughs> well, that's rude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, very far from it, she was dressed, however, in exquisite taste. And then I had no doubt that she had captivated my friend's heart by the more enduring graces of the intellect and soul. She said very few words, and passed at once into her stateroom with Mr. W. My old inquisitiveness now returned. There was no servant that was at the settled... Oh, there was no servant that was at a... Se- there was no servant that was a settled point. I looked, therefore, for my extra baggage. After some delay, a cart arrived at the wharf with an oblong, oblong pine box, which was everything that seemed to be expected. Immediately upon its arrival, we made sail, and in a short time, were safely over the bar and standing out to sea. Iceberg ahead! Um... <laughs> Bloody Mary, please! Over the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The boxing question was, as I say, oblong. 
It was about six feet in length by two and a half in breadth. I observed it attentively. I observed it attentively and like to be precise. Now this shape was peculiar, and no sooner had I seen it than I looked. Uh, then I took que- then I took credit to myself for the accuracy of my guessing. Hmm. I had reached the conclusion. It will be remembered that the extra baggage of my friend, the artist, would prove to be Nicolio, the no, Italian. The line. The line. Did I? Yes. Okay. Now the shape was peculiar, and no sooner had I seen it than I took credit for myself for the accuracy of my guessing. I had reached the conclusion. It will be remembered that the extra baggage of my friend, the artist, would prove to be pictures. Or at least a picture for for I knew he had been for several weeks in conference with Nicolino. Nicolino. <laughs> Nicolino. <laughs> and now, and now here was a box which, from its shape, could possibly contain nothing in the world but a copy of Leonardo's Last Supper and a copy of this very Last Supper done by Rubini the Younger at Florence. I had known for some time to be in the possession of Nicolino. Do you know Florence? <laughs> Sorry. Had to make a little Hannibal Lecter thing there. Okay. This point, therefore, I considered as sufficient. Uh, blah, 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 blah. This point, therefore, I considered as sufficiently settled. I chuckled extensively when I thought of my acumen. Ha 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 ha! Thank you. It was the first time I had ever known why to keep from me. It was the first time I had ever known why to keep from me any of his artistical secrets. But here he evidently, 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 evidently intended to steal a march upon me and smuggle a fine picture to New York under my very nose. I must have a big nose, expecting me to know nothing of the matter. I resolved to quiz him well now and herefore. Hereafter. Which? I wanted to, uh, I wanted to break off like... That, that is quite the plot twist if he indeed has Leonardo uh, Le- Leonardo <laughs> da Vinci's Last Supper there. <laughs> that, that's like, yeah, that's a big thing to have. I was expecting you to make a sound effect of like a um, quiz show, but I resorted into quizzing him. Oh, <laughs> oh, but sorry, it, it does say that he thinks it's a copy of it but done by Rubini. So yeah, sorry. Go mm-hmm. ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay. One thing, however, annoyed me not a little. The box did not go into the extra station room or stateroom. It was deposited in Wyatt's own. And there, too, it remained occupying very nearly the whole of the floor, no doubt to the exceeding discomfort of the artist and his wife. This the more especially as the no this the more especially as the tar or paint with which it was lettered in sprawling capitals, emitted a strong disagreeable, and, to my fancy, a, spe- a peculiarly disgusting odour. Woo Ooh, boy! On the, yep, on the lid were painted the words, Mrs. Adelaide Curtis, Albany, New York, charge of Cornelius Wyatt Esquire, this side up, to be handled with care. Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> Alright. <laughs> ah, this box is fragile, it must be Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Nicolino, my friend. No, just keep, keep going. <laughs> now I was aware that Mrs. Adelaide Curtis of Albany was the artist's wife's mother, but then I looked upon the whole address at a mystification, intended especially for myself. I made up my mind, of course, that the box and contents would never get farther north than the studio of my misanthropic friend in Chamber Street, New York. I am walking here. <laughs> That's just become my generic New York voice. <laughs> For the first three or four days, we had fine weather. Although the wind was dead ahead, having chopped round to the northward, immediately upon our losing sight of the coast, the passengers were consequently, <laughs> consequently in high spirits and disposed hey. to be social. <laughs> I must accept, however, Wyatt and his sisters, who behaved stiffly, that I did not say that word wrong, they really did say yes. stiffly, yes. and I could not help thinking, uncourteously, uncourteously, is it uncourteously? Uncourteously, yeah. Uncourteously, to the rest of the party. Wyatt's conduct I did not so much regard. 
He was gloomy, even beyond his usual habit. In fact, he was morose. Oh. <laughs> but in him, I was prepared for eccentricity. Eccentricity. Yeah, eccentricity. For the sisters, however, I couldn't make no excuse. They secluded themselves in their rooms during the greater part of the passage and absolutely refused, although I repeatedly urged them to hold communications with any person on board. The number you have dialed is not in service. <laughs> or invented yet. Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Wyatt herself was far more agreeable. That is to say, she was chatty, and to be chatty is no slight recommendation at sea. She became excessively intimate. Intimate? Well, with the. No, it gets worse. She became excessively intimate with most of the ladies. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> and to my profound astonishment, invents no equivocal disposition to coque with the men. Well, that is a hard sentence. Let me, let me try to. Invents no equivocal disposition to coque with the men. Coca. Uh, did I say croquet? No, I no. I think you said it. I'm not sure how how to say that. You said oh, equi wow. equivocal. You said that wrong, but I don't know how to say that word actually. C o q u e t. That that is that is a weird word. I do not know how to say that. Yeah, yeah. I was worried. I said croquet. Like she was. She refused to play <laughs> croquet with the men. No. Oh boy. No croqueting here. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> She, amu she amused us all very much, I say. No, sorry, I've read that wrong. She amused us all very much. I say amused and scarcely know how to explain myself. The truth is, I soon found that Mrs. W was far oftener laughed at, with, laughed at than with. The gentleman said little about her, but the ladies, the ladies, in a little while pronounced her a good-hearted thing. Rather indifferent looking, totally uneducated, and decidedly vulgar. Holy shit. <laughs> there we go. All right. The great wonder was how Wyatt had been entrapped into such a match. Wealth was the general solution, but this I knew to be no solution at all, for Wyatt had told me that she neither brought him a dollar, nor had any expectation from any source or whatever. Cha-ching! <laughs> He had not married. No, he had married. He said for love and for love only. I, I dis. I think he's full of shit, and his bride was far more worthy of his love. When I thought of these expressions on the part of my friend, I confessed that it felt indescribably. Pu no, I confessed that I felt indescribe indescribably puzzled. Okay, he's he thinks it's bullshit too. Could it be possible that he was taking leave of his senses? What else could I think? He, so refined, so intellectual, so fa fastidious, with so equisite a perception <laughs> of the faulty, and, and 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 so keen an appreciation of the beautiful. Uh, it, it was uh, so exquisite a perception. You 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 said it kind of funny. <laughs> exquisite yes. a perception of the faulty. Yes. And so keen an appreciation of the beautiful. To be sure, the lady seemed especially fond of him. Oh no, I've lost track. Fond of him, particularly, particularly yeah. so in particularly so in his absence, when she made herself ridiculous by frequent quotations of what had been said by her beloved husband, Mister Wyatt. The word "husband" seemed forever to use one of her own delicate expressions, forever on the tip of her tongue. In the meantime, it was observed by all on board that he avoided her in the most pointed manner, and for the most part, shut himself up alone in his stateroom, where, in fact, he might have said to live altogether, leaving his wife at full liberty to amuse herself, bzzz, and she thought best. <laughs> in the public society of the main cabin. Ooh, that's a... Yep, go, go ahead. <laughs> My conclusion from what I saw and heard was that the artist, by some unaccountable freak of fate, or perhaps in some fit of enthusiastic and fanciful passion, had been induced to unite himself with a person of the hope beneath him. And then the natural result, enter entire and speedy disgust, had ensued. ensued. I pitied him from the bottom of my heart, but could not. For the reason, quite forgive his incommunicativeness in the matter of 
the Last Supper. For this, I resolved to have my revenge! <laughs> that, that revenge thing sort of came out of nowhere. One day, he came upon deck and t- taken his arm as had been my wont. I sauntered with him backwards and forward. His gloom, however, which I considered quite natural under the circumstances, seemed entirely unabated. 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 Okay. He said little, and that moodily, and with evident effort, I ventured a jest or two, and he made a sickening attempt at a smile. Poor fellow. (laughs) As I... As I thought of his wife, I wondered that he could have heart to put on even the semblance of mirth. Of mirth, I determined to commence a series of covert insinuations or innuendos about the oblong box. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> unintentional laughter there. <laughs> yeah. Just to let him perceive gradually that I was not altogether the butt or victim of his little bit of pleasant mystification my first ob- my first observation was by the by way of opening a masked battery i said something about the peculiar shape of that box in your window and as i spoke to th- and as i spoke the words i smiled only winked and touched him gently with my forefinger in, his- in the ribs oh boy <laughs> oh it's getting hot in here <laughs> <laughs> the manner in which Wyatt received this harmless pleasantry convinced me. Is that what you call it? Then? That, <laughs> that he, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> at once that at once that he was mad. At first he stared at me as if he found it impossible to comprehend the witic the witticism of my remark. <laughs> I can't. Freaking the innuendos and the shape of the box, like you know, that's. <laughs> that it, I, 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 I'm just I'm just dirty to a little kid now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Turn into yeah, me. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> I'm a bad influence on you. Yeah. Okay. But at its point, seems slowly to make its way into his brain. His eyes, in, in the same proportion, seem protruding from the this, protruding from their sockets. <laughs> <laughs> then he grew very red then hideous, hideously pale <laughs> then then as if highly amused with what I had insinuated he began a loud and boisterous laugh <laughs> which to my astonish, astonishment he kept up with gradually increasing vigor for ten, min- for ten minutes or more in conclusion he fell flat and heavily, heavily upon the deck. When I ran to uplift him, to all pi- when I ran to uplift him, to all appearance, he was dead. <laughs> so next time someone touches your chest with their finger, be <laughs> warned, you could die. I called assistance, and with much difficulty, we brought we brought him to himself. Upon reviving, he spoke incoherently for some time. <laughs> At length, we. At length we bled him and put him to bed. The next morning he was quite recovered. So far as regarded he mere bodily health his mere bodily health. Of his mind I said nothing, of course. I avoided him during the rest of the passage by advice of the captain, who seemed to coincide with me altogether in my views of his insanity. Cuckoo, but cuckoo, caution me cuckoo. <laughs> But caution me to say nothing on the on this head to any person on board. Several circumstances occurred immediately after this fit of Wyatt, which contributed to heighten the curiosity with which I was already possessed. Among other things, this, I had been nervous, drank too much strong green tea, but wait, wait. I had been nervous, drank too much strong green tea, not nervous, drank too much strong green tea. <laughs> I had been too nervous, drank too much strong green tea, and slept ill at night. In fact, for two, in fact, for two nights I could not be properly said to sleep at all. I'm just I said uh, not properly. I'm just, I, I, I'm just groaning <laughs> to have the time now. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Now my stateroom opened into the main cabin or dining room. 
as did those of all single men on board. <laughs> Wyatt's three rooms were in the after cabin, which was separated from the main one by a slight sliding door, never locked, even at night. As we were almost constantly on a wind, and the breeze was not a little stiff, the ship heeled to leeward very considerably, and whenever her starboard side was to leeward, the sliding door between the cabins slid open, and so remained. Nobody taken the trouble to get up and shut it, but my berth was in. <laughs> but my berth was in such position that when my own stateroom door was open, as well as the sliding door in question, and my own door was always open on account of the heat, I could see into the after cabin quite distinctly, and just at the portion of it too were the. Si uh, Stupid Discord interrupted me. Where situation situated the staterooms of Mr. Wyatt? Well, during two nights, not consecutive, just to let you know, while I lay awake, I clearly saw Mrs. W. Oh, about eleven o'clock upon each night, steal cautiously from the state, steal cautiously from the stateroom of Mr. W. and enter the extra room where she remained until daybreak, when she was called by her husband and went back. That they were, that they were virtually separated was clear. That they were virtually separated was clear. They had separated apartments, no doubt, in contemplate in contemplation of more, of a more permanent divorce. And here, after all, I thought was the mystery of the extra state room. There was another circumstance too, which interested me much. During the two wakeful nights in question, and immediately after the disappearance of Mrs. Wyatt into the extra stateroom, I was attracted by certain singular cautious, subdued noises in that of her husband. Bum chicka wow After listening, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> after listening to them for some time with thoughtful attention, I at length succeeded perfectly in translating their important. They were sounds occasioned by the artist in pry and open the oblong box by means of a chisel and mallet, the later being, the later being apparently muffled or deafened by some soft woolen or cotton substance in which its head was enveloped. This time you did not hear anything because it was muffled and deadened. <laughs> yes. In a manner, in this manner, I fancied I could distinguish the precise moment where he fairly disengaged a lid, also that I could determine which he removed it altogether, and when he deposited upon the lower berth in his room, this later point I knew, for example, by certain, by certain slight taps which the lid made in striking against the wooden engines of the wooden edges of the berth, as he endeavoured, endeavoured, as he e devoured, as he endeavoured to lay it down very gently, there being no room for it on the floor. After this, there was a dead stillness, and I heard nothing more upon either occasion until nearly daybreak, unless perhaps I may mention a low sobbing or murmuring sound, <laughs> so so very much suppressed as to be nearly inaudible, inaudible if indeed the whole of this later noise was were not produced by my own imagination. I say it seemed resembled sobbing or, or sighting, but of course Sighing. it could not have been either. Sighing. Yeah. But of not, it could not be. I. But of course, it could not have been either. I rather think of it. I rather think it was a ringing in my own ears. Ring, ring. <laughs> Mr. Wyatt, no doubt, according to custom, was merely given the rein to one of his hobbies, indulgent in one of his fits of artistic enthusiasm. He had opened his oblong box in order to feast his <laughs> eyes on the pictorial treasure within. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Not... <laughs> yeah, you are a bad influence on me. That's why even innocent sentences like that suddenly get a double meaning. <laughs> it also doesn't help that V stands right at the end of the page. So right, there's a little pause before um, his eyes on the pictorial treasure within. Yeah. <laughs> there was nothing in this. Okay. There was there was nothing in this. However, to make him sob. I repeat, therefore, that it must have been simply a freak of my own fancy. This tempted by good Captain Hardy's green tea. Ugh, man. Just before dawn, <laughs> on each of the two nights of which I speak, I distinctly heard Mr. 
Dr. Wyatt replaced the lid upon the oblong box and forced the nails into the old places by means of the muffled mallet. Ba-chunk, ba-chunk. <laughs> Having done this, he issued from the stateroom, fully dressed, and proceeded to call Mrs. W. from hers. Are we dealing with vampires here? Well, I, I don't want to spoil the surprise, so let's keep going. Yeah. Okay. We had been at sea seven days and were now off Cape Hatteras when there came a tremendously heavy blow from the southwest. We were in a measure prepared for it. However, as the weather had been holding out threats for some time, everything was made snug, alow, and aloft. And as the wind steadily freshened, we lay to at length under spankler and (laughs) poor toast. (laughs) <laughs> under spanker and foretop sail <laughs> <laughs> what did I say <laughs> splanker or something like something to that effect <laughs> but you completely, you completely butchered foretop sail at any rate <laughs> under spanker and foretop sail I have no Both idea what the hell the spanker is but <laughs> <laughs> innuendo innuendo um <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the this... noise we should keep keep doing in the following. Whenever we whenever we find something hilarious in the text, just somebody lo- leans into the microphone and goes, "You know, Wendo." <laughs> <laughs> you can blame the story for that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> in this trim, we rode safe enough for forty-eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> too easy. <laughs> The ship, provi- pro- the ship provided herself an excellent sea boat, boat in many respects. <laughs> sea boat. <laughs> yeah. The ship provided herself an, ex- an excellent sea boat in many respects, and shipping no water of any consequence. At the end of this period, however, the gale had freshened into a hurricane, and uh, and uh, after sail split into ribbons, <laughs> bringing us so much stuff. Of the water that we slipped several prodigious, prodigious seas. We shipped several prodigious what? seas. Or Whoa. Prodigious seas. Prodigious. Yes. One immediately after the other. They must have traveled far then. Oh. <laughs> One immediately after the other. By this accident, we lost three men overboard of the caboose. <laughs> Innuendo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And nearly the whole of the larboard. Bulwarks. <laughs> La bon Scarcely bulwarks. had we. <laughs> that sounds like some kind of Australian jibber jabber to me. <laughs> La bon bulwarks. Scarcely. <laughs> go ahead. Go. Sorry. Sorry. Scarcely had we removed our senses before the foretop sail. Foretop sail went into sh- I love how, shreds. I love how, how unsure you are. <laughs> the foretop <of> sail. <laughs> The four top sail went into the shreds when we got up the when we got up a storm stay sail and with this did pretty well for some hours the ship heading the sea much more steadily than before the gale still head on however and we saw no signs of its abating abating the rigging abating yeah. the the rigging was found to be ill fitted and greatly strained and on the third day of the blow about five in the afternoon. A mizzen mast in a heavy lurch. I was expecting you to go, you rang. <laughs> you rang. Yeah, okay, do it again. <laughs> heavy lurch. In a heavy lurch. You rang. To windward went by the board. <clears throat> For an hour or more, we tried in vain to get rid of it, on account of the prodigious rolling of the ship. <clears throat> and before we had succeeded, the carpenter came aft and announced four feet of water in the hold. To add to our dilemma, we found the pumps. Choked and nearly useless. <laughs> Not sure why a pump would make those kinds of noises, but okay. All was now confusion and despair, oh, but an no. effort was made to lighten the ship by throwing overboard as much of her cargo Sploosh. as could be reached, <laughs> and by cutting away the two masts that remained. <sighs> this was at last accomplished but we were still unable to do anything about the pumps. <laughs> and in the meantime, the leak gained on us very fast. You knew Wendo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> At sundown, the gale had sensibly Ooh. diminished in violence, and as the sea went down with it, we still entertained faint hopes of saving ourselves in the boats. 
at 8p.m. The clouds broke away to windward, and we had the advantage of a full moon! Oh. A piece of good... A piece of good... Fur, uh, you got to love those sea dogs, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> sea dogs. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. A piece of good for- fortune which served wonderfully to cheer our drooping spirits. <laughs> After incredible labour was succeeded at length in getting the longboat over the side without material accident, innuendo, <laughs> and into this we crowded the whole of the crew and most of the pl- passengers. This party made off immediately, and after undergoing more suffering, oh. finally arrived in safety at Ocracoke Inlet on the third day after the wreck. Oh, Ocracoke. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Fourteen passengers with captain remained on board, resolving to trust their fortunes to the jolly butt of a boat at the stern. <laughs> jolly butt. <laughs> I think you were thinking of jelly butt and you got confused. <laughs> okay, keep going, keep going. We, we lowered it without difficulty, <laughs> although it was only by a miracle that we prevented it from swamping as it touched the water. Innuendo. It contained when a <laughs> it contained when a float the captain and his wife, Mrs. Wyatt, and party, a Mexican officer. Hello. <laughs> four, wife, four children, and myself with a <laughs> African American valet. Oh, you <laughs> are being coy, huh? All right, go ahead. <laughs> the slurs and this, the slurs. Well, they weren't slurs back then, but yeah, they're, they're not. Oh. They're not PC today, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we're worried about being PC. Yet we're making all these crude sexual innuendo jokes. But anyway, we had no room, of course, for anything except a few positively necessary instruments. <laughs> Ah, that, I don't know what the hell that was supposed to be. <laughs> Some provisions and the clothes upon our backs. No one had thought of even attempting to save anything more. We must have been the astonishment of all. Then, without having proceeded a few pheffins from the ship, Mr. Wyatt stood up in the stern sheets and coolly demanded of Captain, Who's at the door? Oh, sorry, the cat wants to go out. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> well, there you are. <laughs> you know, you know, this is, you know this, this hearing... is going to require a lot of editing now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> now the, yeah, the, the, the all that no... I, I want to say, like, I'm not, I'm, I'm busting your chops, but you know, some of some of these are, some of these sentences are genuinely difficult to read. Mm-hmm. So, first of all, I think it's just funny the way you sometimes, you know, especially like right now when you said fathoms, you kind of like murmured it, fathoms, <laughs> things oh, like that. Sorry. But, but you know, fathoms. but especially like things like, like even Kaiser's pussy can't give us a break. Quote so. <laughs> <laughs> the kitty, meow the more. Yeah. Um, okay, let me, re- let me redo this, okay. We had no room, of course, for anything except for a, except a few positively necessary instruments, some provisions and the clothes upon our backs. No one had thought of even attempting to save anything more. We must have been astonishment of them all when having proceeded a few fathoms from the ship. Mr. Wise stood up in the stern sheets and coolly demanded of Captain Hardy that the boat should should be put back for the purpose of taking in his oblong box. Shoe fly, stop it! Sit down, Mr. Wyatt, replied the captain somewhat sternly. You will capsize us all if you do not sit quite still. Our gum whale is almost in the water now. Uh, that's... <laughs> that wasn't... <laughs> whale noise. Wait, what, what, what do whales make? They, like... <laughs> I, I, I'm making all kinds of weird noises now. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> the box! Vociferated. Vociferated? Okay, I think, that's, I I, that. I think maybe. Vociferated. Uh, yeah. The box! Vociferated Mr. Wyatt, still standing. The box, I say! Captain Hardy, you cannot! You will not refuse me! It's weight that will be the trifle! It is nothing! Mere nothing! By the mother who bore you! For the love of heaven! By your hope of salvation! I implore you to put back for the box! Mmm, delicious trifles. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Call back. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I was actually quite impressed with that. Um, yeah, you did you, went, you did that well. Excellent. Good reading. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right, let's keep Thank going. Thank you. I deserve a gold sticker for that. Yes, you do. Mm-hmm. The, the captain for a moment seemed touched by the earnest of 
of the artist, but he regained his stern composure and merely said, Mr. Wyatt, you are mad. I cannot listen to you. Sit down, I say, or you will swamp the boat. Stay. Hold them. Seize them. He is about to spring overboard. There. I knew it. He is over. Sploosh. <laughs> All right. As the captain said this, Mr. Wyatt, in fact, sprang from the boat, and as we were yet in the lee of the wreck, succeeded by almost superhuman ex exer exertion. Exer yeah, exertion, yeah. I think that's like an old way of spelling that. Mm -hmm. In getting hold of a rope which hung from the fore chains. In another moment, he was on board and rushing frantic frantically down into the cabin. In the meantime, we had swept astern of the ship, and being quite out of her lee, we were at the mercy of the tremendous sea, which was still running. We made a determined effort to put back, but our little boat was like a feather in the breath of the tempest. We saw at a glance that the doom of the unfortunate artist was sealed. <laughs> that took a bit long, sorry. <laughs> I was scrolling down, that's why I was a bit silent. Yeah, yeah, no. As our distance from the wreck rapidly increased, the madman, for as such only could we regard him as so, was seen to emerge from the companion, way up, which, by dint of strength that appeared gigantic, he dragged bodily the oblong box, while we gazed in the, extreme, the extremity of astonishment, <gasps> he passed rapidly... So several turns into a three-inch rope, first around the box, the, not the blocks, the box, and then around his body, innuendo. <laughs> in another instant... <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, you're going to love this once we get to the end of the story. <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> in another instant, both body and box were in the sea, disappearing suddenly at once and forever. We lingered a while, sadly upon our oars, with our eyes riveted upon the spot. At length we pulled away. The silence remained unbroken for an hour. Finally, I hazarded a remark. Did you observe, Captain, how suddenly they sank? Was, that, was not that exceedingly singular thing? I confess that I entertain, entertained some feeble hope of his final deliverance when I saw him lash himself to the box and committed himself to the sea. They sank as a matter of course, replied the captain, and that like a shot, they will soon rise again. However, but not, in, but not till the salt melts. The salt, I ejaculated. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I love old English. You knew that was coming. <laughs> you knew that was coming, didn't you? No, I didn't. I actually had forgotten, but yeah, that's what that, it, that word meant back in the day. <laughs> Yes, keep ejaculating. I mean, reading. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, boy. Hush, said the captain, pointing to the wife and sisters of the deceased. And wipe yourself we must off. Talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We oh. must talk of these things at some more appropriate time. Exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. We suffered much and made a narrow escape, but fortune befriended us, as well as our mates in the longboat. We landed, in fine, more dead than alive, after four days of intense distress, upon the beach opposite R Roanoke Island. Roanoke Island. Roanoke. We remained maybe, we... Ro maybe Roanoke, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Roanoke. Yeah. We remained here a week. We're not ill-treated by wreckers. And, shoo, and at length obtained a passage to New York. <laughs> About a month after the loss of the independence, I happened to meet Captain Hardy in Broadway. Broadway, Captain Hardy. it's Broadway. Captain Hardy. Our conversation turned naturally upon the disaster, and especially upon the sad fate of Paul Wyatt. I thus learned the following peculiar particulars. Yes. The artist had engaged... Pa passage for himself, wife, two sisters, and a servant. His wife was, indeed, as she had been represented, a most lovely and most accomplished woman. On the morning of the 14th of June, the day in which I first visited the ship, the lady suddenly sickened and died. The young husband was frantic with grief, but circumstances 
imperat sorry, I'm about to have gas here. Imperatively for bla- forbade uh, sorry, t- I warned you about that. Okay. And and deferring his voyage to New York. It was necessary to take her mother, the corpse of his adored wife, and on the other hand, the universal prejudice which would prevent his doing so openly was well known. Nine tenths of the passengers would have abandoned the ship rather than take passage with a dead body. In this dilemma, Captain Hardy arranged that the corpse, being first park, first partially embalmed and packed with a large quantity of salt in a box of suitable dimensions, should be chewed. Come, leave me alone, fly. Should be conveyed on board as merchandise. Ooh. Nothing was to be said of the lady's decease, and as it was well understood that Mr. Wyatt had engaged passage, passage for his wife, it became necessary that some person should personate her, person, un, un, impersonate her during the voyage. Yes, yeah, so I guess Thus, this was before the they put lady. that in, in impersonate. Yeah. <laughs> This the deceased lady's maid was easily prevailed on to do. The extra stale, the extra stateroom originally engaged for this girl during the, her mistress's life was now mere, merely retained. In this stateroom, the persuado w- wife slept, of the, course, every <laughs> night. The pseudo wife. The pseudo wife. Yeah. Slept, of course, every night. In the daytime, she performed to the best of her ability the part of her mistress whose person it had been carefully ascertained was unknown to any of the passengers on board. My own mistake, Rose, innuendo. Naturally <laughs> enough, through... <laughs> Naturally enough, though, too careless, too, inquisis- too inquisitive, and too impulsive a temperament. But of late, it is a rare thing that I slept soundly at night. This is a continuance Countenance. with consonants which haunts me turn as i will there is a there is an hysterical laugh which will forever ring in my ears <laughs> <laughs> the end the end <laughs> yeah that's why i was saying like uh when he when he said that the guy when he was roping putting that rope around the box and himself and when he leaned in and said innuendo like i really really wanted to say what the hell is this like bondage and necrophilia <laughs> all at the same time s n m yeah extreme s n m yeah <laughs> so how did you like that story the oblong box honestly i reckon that it's better hearing them from you <laughs> okay but now that you read it, what, what what did you think about it? And did and also importantly, did you figure it figure out that the wife was in the box the whole time? Yeah, knowing, yeah, I did find it a little bit predictable. Yeah, I did. I, I think because... well written story though, incredibly well written, but I did find it a bit more predictable compared to Poe's other works. Yeah, yeah, and when I say this is one of my favorites, I think part of it is just because this was one of the first Poe stories I ever read, and I didn't have like a baseline for how Poe stories go. So, uh, for me, it was a bit more of a surprise. I mean, I think I eventually started to kind of guess, especially once they talk about, like, how his wife is acting, uh, you know, weird and vulgar, that, okay, you know, uh, something's up with them. But, like, you know, the fact that the guy basically drowns himself with his, like, wife's body, um, you know, that's a bit of, you know, that's quite the extreme turn, to say the least. Yeah. (laughs) Oh man, I did not, but I had forgotten about the ejaculation. That was that was just a <laughs> nice little surprise there towards the end. <laughs> Innuendo. <laughs> yeah. So you know, this may not be the most impressive of the post stories. I will agree, but this actually, but it is one of my favorites. This is this is, I um and uh yeah yeah, but th- that's what I said. Like there's there's not. I don't really have. There isn't much in the sense of a big. Uh, you know, there is, you know, there's a shocking revelation, obviously. That's kind of what, what the, you know, this um, era, which I've forgotten, um, gothic horror, yeah, this is kind of what the whole, this is, um, you could, you could maybe even say that this is maybe almost a by the numbers post story, would you agree? Mm-hmm. A little bit, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, but I do, but I agree with you. It's very well written. That's why, and I still, when I when I come back to it, I'm always impressed. Like, wow, this actually is a really good story because I'm always remembering that it isn't as good 
as I recall. But now as you were reading it, like I think again, I thought to myself, this is actually really good. And you, yeah, you deserve you deserve full credit for the the character lines. You de you actually delivered those really well. So yeah. So maybe we should do that in the future, that uh, I let you read all the dialogue, <laughs> maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the Oblong Box, and if you don't have anything else to say, Kaiser, uh, then maybe we should uh, end this podcast. And I hope you enjoyed listening to us read another Edgar Allan Poe story, and uh, uh, we still have plenty more to do in the future. And I, mm -hmm. again, I we didn't get any uh, requests last time, but again, I, you know, I, I do request that if people lis listen to the whole story this time around, that maybe maybe you request another story in the comments, and also tell us in the comments, do you want us to re do that H.P. Lovecraft podcast at some point, maybe? So, Hi, yes. Yes, but... Uh, with that, I guess we'll end it. So I'm Hunter the Hunter Mackinen signing off. Kaiser, you got anything, any last words here? Tune in to Sunday Night Kaiser and Tuesday Night Kaiser every Sunday and Tuesday night on the official Emerald Rangers Twitch page. Alrighty. Uh, so this is Hunter the Hunter Mackinen. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.